Greetings, Darklings, from across the interweb. It is once again I, the Duchess Precious Ken. I have an extremely exciting guest here. Um, but first, I will say hello, uh, and I'll give a shout out to a couple things that I've been listening to so that we have um, before I dive into the interview here. And let's start off with, uh, there's a couple exciting things that came out. Um, I'm going to have reviews coming up for some of these, but new single from Go Fight uh, called Dead Girl just came out. Uh, this is the first one that uh, Jim has put out in a second, and it is just what you want from a Go Fight single. It is crunchy. It is infectious. It should be on dance floors everywhere coming up soon. <laughs> um, and there's a pre-order that's out for a dog tablet. Um, I'm always stoked for that. Uh, Martin just brings together just a great collaboration and feel. And uh, I have only heard two tracks off it so far, but it is called Ashes and available from Dog Tablet. And also coming up here, uh, there's going to be a, I don't know, a symposium of some kind, but it's going to be uh, Martin King and Martin Atkins uh, talking through some aspects of making music and the business end of it. And that is always something that every band that gets a chance to should log into and listen to. And the final one I'll give a shout out to right now is a new single from The Burying Kind, uh, which, as you know, was last year a culmination of Dan Milligan from The Joy Thieves um, and uh, uh Scott David Cart uh, from um, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Scott David Allen um, uh, from uh, Covenant of Thorns, and they have gotten together to, to me, a goth expert and an industrial expert making the best shoegaze album I've heard in the last five to 10 years. Um, so they're coming up with their sophomore album number two, but this is a single off it called Coming Through and it's just gorgeous and textural and amazing. So without further ado, my very special guest, Curse Mackey. I can... Hi, Curse. Uh, it Thanks is wonderful me. to have you back as always. Um, we've done an interview um, a couple times, once uh, when we had for the festival um, and then uh, a previous podcast one. So nice. it's, yeah, great to bring you back. And I kind of said to you before we started on this, instead of doing the, uh, you know, who are you? What have you done? Where are you from? I want to jump right in. You have a new album out, which is your sophomore album, uh, which to me really always tells me the tale of an artist or a band. And it it's not that you haven't had a million albums with, you know, Pig Face and uh, Evil Mothers and, you know, going back in your history. But this one being yours, truly, right. you know, through body to bone and... One of the things, you know, I talked to you about, I was thinking about is you've been this world-class chef for all these years, kind of playing in other people's restaurants, you know, while they were kind of directing the decor and things like that. And you were brought in to just make great food. And now with these last couple albums, but this one in particular, because you got a little experience of doing that under your belt, you're the owner, operator, promoter, everything. And I really want to get in touch with how that's been a different experience for you, especially as coming from someone who, you know, wasn't just up and coming. You've done shows at the top level, you know, I mean, for for the rooms and done this and now getting to have that experience with your own creation and baby. Sure. Uh, I totally get what you're saying. And uh, this album, Immoral Emporium, as you said, it's my second solo record. And uh, yeah, it's it's energizing because um, unlike the longstanding, highly established acts that I've participated with yeah. in the past and continue to at times, um, this album is like... It's, this is an album that was written for like the here and now. Uh, it's not meant really to be a, a 
throwback record. I'm not chasing a trend. It's just really a very good summary of, of the sounds and ingredients that I like to work with. And essentially, I wanted to make a record first off that I wanted to listen to and make music for myself during a really hard period of time yeah. over the last couple of years, which that's a shared experience amongst all of us. Every, every musician uh, and production worker or service worker in, in a restaurant, bartender, touring personnel, like everybody got fucked over the last two years. They got fucked mentally, financially, any, any, all the creative class, if you will, really like was hit extremely hard during the last couple of years. And that creates a lot of uncertainty. So the only way I could get through the uncertainty and I felt a lot of it was to dig in and, and claw my way through coming up with something that I felt really passionate about that I could, a record that I made for myself um, in very close collaboration with my good friend, Chase Dobson, who co-produced the record with me along with the, the previous record instant exorcism and chase is a lifelong friend, a, a true brother, if you will. And um, so, but again, like his mindset during the making of this record was highly fractured too, because he was going through the same things. And it's like, you kind of wonder like, man, I, how, why am I spending money, like investing in this record? Cause I'm not sure how the next rent check, Right. is going to manifest and shit like that. You know, like that's real survival level uh, stuff that started coming into place. Whereas instant exorcism was a bit more phantasmagorical and had this uh, magic surrealism vibe going on. Uh, kind of like a parallel universe dystopian landscape, like uh, Immoral Emporium just brought all that shit crashing down. Like there's no need to even talk about sci-fi now it's here it's fucking just landed in my living room the, the and, dystopia has happened and, I, and i'm trapped underneath the vehicle and the vehicle is running and it's hot and like my apartment's on fire like how, how am i going to get through this like that's <laughs> kind of the some of the things that were going on and so um yeah. ultimately i felt like i felt direction that i could have is to try to make a record that again, as I said, that I would love, but also as almost like a gift to everybody that survived the, this weird time, all the dark wave industrial DJs, all the fans, people like you, Ken, that were so supportive of independent artists during a really hard time over the last couple of years. The album is really my gratitude uh, in the best, most eloquent way I can try to put it across to, to everybody out there that supports my music and, and, and just to the other bands and artists and, and the promoters, DJs, like I said, it's, it's just a record for everybody. And I hope that uh, people find something to enjoy from it, even though it is highly painful at times within the content. Sure, sure. I, I want to ask too, going along with this before we start jumping into individual tracks and, and things going on with them, um, was there kind of an extra pressure that that came with this album? Because, like I said, you had, you know, kind of gone for other people for so long. And when you did Instant Extra, it, it was you putting yourself out there in that way, but with a little bit of house money with a little bit of devil may care, you know what I mean? Like sure. it's my first solo. If it does great, great. But if it doesn't, you know, you still were kind of tied back to that other world of kind of coming in for other people. And then once it was a success and people did respond to it, now how do you go up a level from that when you've proven that you can do it on your own so now that's the expectation. Did did that kind of have a different mindset or feel from you when you were going into this record? Yes, it, it did. Um, I think, and I think that's just natural. The first one was this lifelong energy, um, and then I'm like, hey, I'm kind of not real busy right now, so why don't I go ahead and uh, I'm doing too much DJing and. Uh, behind the scenes work and not enough of what I like to do. So instant exorcism was me getting the, that out of my system, literally by putting out those 11 songs and, and, and getting out 
touring behind it. And that was all going quite well until again, um, the, the great fracture occurred in 2020. Uh, and then that shifted my momentum a lot. Uh, I had already started writing Immoral Emporium, just a couple of quick sketches before I went on tour with Zymox in 2020. And then shortly thereafter, we found ourselves back at home wondering what was going to happen. We were just delayed for a little bit. And then the Pig Face Tour of 2020, hello, Kitty, uh, the Pig Face Tour of 2020 that I had set two months of my life aside for also got derailed. Um, and then all of a sudden, it's like, shit, well, well, months are passing now. What's What do we do? So I just had to go back in and start writing. Uh, but my mindset was completely just like bruised and concerned about my just general well-being and just seeing everything going on. It was so much uncertainty in the world at that time. Not that there isn't always, but you know what I mean? So yeah, it was just, uh, I think there was more internal pressure. There was more uh, emotion, more vulnerability taking place, uh, a, a, a need to get it out. But also along with that, um, a desire to not create the same album twice and to continue to push boundaries and challenge what the genre boundaries are, or what a goth record or industrial dark wave, what people's perception of what these things are supposed to sound like don't always vibe with like what I think it could sound like. Right. right. So this record is to me, an example of trying to push things forward, but also inevitably um, the sound palette, sound palette certainly uh, is inspired by the artists that I've worked with and the music that I like and the sense that I like, which happen to relate to other bands as well that, that I listen to or, or like. So, you know, there's going to be similarities and things may remind people of other things, but ultimately I think this record uh, is, uh, is very much uh, my voice along with great support from, from the people that helped on the production side, like Chase. So I, I love that you said that. And, and I think that's very true because <laughs> whether it's Sounds and Shadows or other groups or, you know, uh, places where people come together to discuss the inevitable, what is goth music? Um, which I, is the worst kind of wankery, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But it, it is an important question to ask when referring, like you said, I'm putting out this new record. I'm not going to put out Instant Exorcism Part 2. You know, what is it that you said to yourself going in the gate? Because kind of like we mentioned, you have such a long career and so many different spices you've picked up along the way to put into the stew and must have, I imagine, a stack of B-sides, you know, miles and miles long to pick through or choose from different beats that maybe you thought about or worked on different instrumentation so on and so forth what was the thing with this record that you said here's how i'm going to make this sound fresh i think that just comes from just doing it and getting to work and and once i really i hit a point of frustration probably about one third of the way through where I was like where am I going with this I don't know and then that kind of like it's just like you bottom out and then uh either quit give up or really like have a serious uh heart to heart with yourself and and get get focused even more and get just like bring more energy than what went into the previous record. Not, and I know when I'm pushing myself or not. Right. Or if I'm just trying to like, oh, I just need a song, write a song, you know, it's, I, these, these songs underwent a lot of, uh, and we'll talk about them underwent, a, I think a lot of scrutiny by me first off, probably too much. And then, um, and then I'm able to share it with Chase and, and then we can nurture the mix into its final, final spot. But, you know, conceptually, this record was was really is, uh, strangely enough, like Instant Exorcism Part 2 because of the storylines and, and, and kind of the, the protagonist and the way I write uh, that I did it. View, I viewed that, that this was like the world of Instant Exorcism, but now it has basically crash landed 
in modern day right through. now. Yeah. So <laughs> here we, and now we are in the thick of it and immoral emporium is really about like, you know, nothing is quite what it seems. And it's just a huge misinformation, disinformation age that we're involved in now. And basically almost everyone and anything is for sale if you have enough money and you can get anything you want almost on demand. Um, and it's just a very, but like even if you want truth, that's like one of the hardest things to find. So there's a line and um, it's like, it's a fine line between reality and truth. So it's kind of about those dualities uh, and people are existing in their own worlds, although we're all in the same one. Um, people have different senses of realities now. And it's really magnified. So the album kind of delves into those uh, concepts while, you know, I'm just an individual trying to find my way in the world and trying to find some hope. I, I do like that you said that, because to me, that's something I pictured when, when I was listening to this and going through it was almost like a Guillermo del Toro, like the worst kind of dark capitalism troll market. You know what I mean? Right. Of, of wandering through, you know, somewhere between like, you know, uh, street folk and like mysticism and, you know, Mad Max coming together in this marketplace where life is cheap and, you know, souls are bought and sold, you know, for the couple people at the master blaster level. Right. And I I think it, it's great to hear that like you went in with a centralized concept like that because it is. I mean, when you talk about a shared experience, I can't think of a time, at least in my life in 45 years, that I've ever felt this much, not just me, everybody I know and everybody around me, post-capitalism, just futility. Just yeah. how do I drag myself out of bed in the morning and bother to rage against this machine when it just seems so dark and insurmountable. Correct. Yeah. You're right there. You, you understand where I'm coming from with it. So I, I want to start going through um, some of these tracks individually now sure. and, and give you a chance to share a little bit about what went into it. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask for, for you as a general for the album is looking behind you at the, the artwork and whatnot. I know another thing that happened during this album coming into being is you and Rona went through a move, I, you know, an upgrade and yeah, assembling right. a new studio, a new place to, to record this and do it. Yeah. And to me, I think there is an importance in that, like an extra level of terror that you're building the set piece of where this will be recorded at the same time you're writing it and putting the songs into reality. How much do you feel like that kind of when you said being hard on yourself or taking an extra look um, at the production of these songs, how much of that really was that you don't, it's not a place you've been 20 years. You don't know where the exact place to put the microphone mm -hmm. is and get the right slant. You don't know, you know, how this is going to look or feel or sound in this way. How did building that make its way into the album itself? Um, I, I feel like it created a much more stressful record. Uh, the process on me, I felt was more painful than pleasurable. Uh, the pleasure has finally come in the fact that it's out. Um, so like life circumstances were, were way heavier during the recording of this record than the first one, because as you mentioned, we had Rona and I, we, from my, my life partner, uh, Rona Rushart from Sign that we're discussing, um, she and I, we had to move twice in, over a nine month period or twice within one year. So that really fucked me up because I get a little momentum going and then like we got like hey 30 day notice I'm like oh no so that means start tearing shit down now and start trying to find a place to live so we had to do that twice and it was very rough and then rebuilding the studio so i know that within that i probably lost four months 
of time and then you just lose momentum and um so yeah so that these are all like just this is just life and it just works its way into your art and so again that just created a much more intense personal and vulnerable record because i'm trying to write something cool while all of these very challenging things are taking place on a personal level psychologically as well as like at a world community level i'm trying to bring all these things in while also like trying to get music out so it doesn't take which ultimately was three years between this record and the first one which seems so weird but it really is um so there's that pressure too to not let it linger any longer like this thing has got to get done get out and be on its way because again it is a gift to the listener and to the audience and i want the music to be shared and for people to enjoy it and we can tell these stories and, and people can uh, create their own uh, assumptions in as they listen so before we unwrap it let's start with the cover okay yeah. Okay. And I, I have mine here to look through, but uh, everybody, you know, should definitely go check this out. And I know how closely tied you are to the visual uh, art as it applies to your music. Set the scene for what this cover was, what it came from, and how it ties together with your music. So the original is this piece that I made, right, sometime during the crisis we all experienced and then so i'd make these all the time like these usually like a 12 by 12 collage um they usually get titles which often become song titles or vice versa and then rona and i will start getting just take photos at unique angles of the artwork start changing up uh, the color scheme digitally and ultimately we landed on the little detail from that painting that became the cover so it's all like collage mixed media based paintings that i i make that ultimately become the the visual look of the album same thing with instant exorcism which i i think i just i find that quite fun and gratifying to have the visual component along with the audio yes i mean i would too if i had any uh visual art talent myself luckily i have a colin which is almost as good as having talent yourself you know if you just have a colin yeah you know, all you need is an exacto knife some glue stick and some weird pictures and start cutting it up and have fun <laughs> so you have the cover here and you come out with it um i want to talk to because to me opening tracks are are such a big deal. You know, I mean, if you're going to put any real time, effort, thought into the order that your songs are coming in and take your listeners on a journey, uh, the opener to me is the most important part. So Smoking Tongues, uh, yeah. which you have the video for, um, tell me a little bit about how this set the stage for you. Anybody that you had you know, that was a contributor that went along with it. And, you know, give me a, a little juice on the story of why this was your track where you said, that's my opener. Right. It became the opener because it was the last song I wrote for the album. And I was struck by, um, it, it sort of a, had a uniqueness. So I knew I was tapping into something new. Um, that I found was pretty provocative and it's almost a little synth pop-ish, I guess, in a way, but um, there was something magnetic about it that I really liked. And that, when I was creating this album sequence, at first I kind of had it like, oh, this is a different kind of track. Maybe I'll bury it somewhere and, you know, track six or seven, middle aside to, because it's, it's different. And then as I was really analyzing the lyrics and figuring out what I was talking about and the whole concept of the record, I just decided that there's something to this track that is so unique uh, and almost stripped down a little more naked than I would normally put across maybe on an opening song where it might be that the theory might be just come out, 
slamming with the, the most like aggressive industrial banger possible, right? Always open with the banger. I mean, that is that is the tale as old as time. <laughs> right. So to not repeat the past, um, I felt it would be a little more uh, challenging to both myself and the listener, uh, more risky to put the song first uh, because really there's a, a dialogue between me and the listener within the lyrics. Um, I, I am far from sure about our future, believe these words, which means that this may be the last time you and I speak. You might take that. You might decide that that song sucks and you're out of here and you'll miss out on a lot of things that you might like. So I think it gave a chance to set the stage more for the album, much like a good film. Yeah as opposed to just coming out with a big giant fight scene because people have short attention spans. Like you're not... trusting in your listeners with this. And I, I love that. I, to me, whether you're talking about TV shows, movies, anything like that, books, I think one of the biggest failings of the modern era is that we assume the people listening to us are dumb, are, are not clever enough to get what we're doing and, and I love kind of A, that you say that, kind of having a trust in your listener of challenging them, say, I'm going to start right off not assuming you have no attention span. I'm assuming you showed up here because you know who I am and you're going to understand this ride that I'm going to take you on. Right. For 43 minutes and 43 seconds, I think uh, yeah. it, it, there's a payoff in that. So I put a lot of thought into the the sequencing of the songs. Um, and that's why Smoking Tongues ended up front and center. I, I love that. And I love the fact that you wrote it last because that's not something I always hear um, that the opening track was the last one you wrote. But it makes sense because you didn't know what the whole story was. You didn't know this concept of the Emporium was really fully developed until you finished that. So that really maybe is the best way to lead in to set the stage, you know? I think so. So. <clears throat> so next up then you roll into a sharp reminder and you've set the stage now, you've started going on the journey. What was a sharp reminder to you? Yeah, sharp reminder. <clears throat> I mean, I, I kind of visualize this sort of, uh, Lost Highway, Lynchian, sort of noir, desolate cityscape. And that's where we're sort of entering into that, like we're going into what's going to come and, uh, and scars rise to the surface um, because over time, as we are left to deal with things that we may should have been more responsible about, um, you know, truths are told and uh, sometimes we just, you know, it's like we could all use a little purpose. It's like sometimes you just need somebody to help also steer you in the right direction. So there's various allegories like that, you know, and I'm just making this shit up as we go, Ken, because I don't know what the fuck my record's I, about, quite honestly. I mean, I'm not going to tell you even if I do. No, I'm Yeah, just... you, you don't need to. You know what I mean? I think it's important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I, when mm -hmm. I hear this track, I think of it as a, and I've used this to describe things before, but you can't see beyond the headlights track. Right. Like to me, this song is all about, you're feeling the motion of it, but your entire scope of vision is five feet in front of you while you're listening to this song because you don't know where it's going. And you want to know. There's, there's a tension there. There's a, you know, it, it's building towards something but you can't see beyond your headlights and then you hit that big drop Boom. so speaking of which <laughs> let's uh let's jump ahead here to literally the reveal and i love the fact of how we talked about that and it even came in with the title it's a reveal that's right so that one picks it up into um you know that was a candidate for an for an opening track of the album as well i could have seen that yeah so um, Justin McGrath, uh, my good friend, uh, 
has a project called Polyfuse. Um, he contributed some really cool synths, some modular synth loops that I chopped up on that one. Uh, Chase Dobson, of course, was active on that. And um, I just, you know, obviously I, I like songs that are club driven or yeah. and that I know this is going to sound fucking awesome at the castle in Tampa or, you know, in your finer uh, nightclubs. And I think it's just a really fresh take on, on industrial dance music. I mean, and again, it's, it's a banger and, and you just, an album can't have too many bangers. That's my, that's my uh, firm belief. Um, but, but I agree too. And I like the way that this one, again, it is an arrival song. And, and that's why I'm glad that you didn't open with it because we'd already have gotten there. And I, I kind of, again, going back to the metaphor of the Emporium itself, this is the front. This is the, the legitimate business of the club or whatever is happening where then our hero is going to travel through this uh, shiny glitzy version of what the true debauchery of the emporium is which is behind the curtain of this song and and i at least for me that was my big takeaway on this one and what i felt going into it nice i like that yeah um i, I sense that as well i mean it is the reveal so it is kind of like all right let's let's get in here and see what's happening um, you did mention to the modular sense on this one, and I would, I'll feel bad because, you know, Colin's not on here with me for our tech nerds. Uh, what do you know, some of the uh, modulars that went into creating sounds on this one? Yeah, I mean, all was, them. <laughs> um, there's quite a few things. Um uh, Some Waldorf stuff, um, the Nord modular. Uh, both myself and Justin have uh, Nord modulars. Uh, what else? Uh, is there Maliko, something about Maliko that one in that you like about it? The the Nord, is there something about it that you just, that one speaks to you as opposed to using a different one? Um, I've just had it forever. And uh, like, I'm not really um, a Euro rack builder type of uh, <laughs> modular synth guy. So I just have my... I'm just, I keep, I'm looking this way because I'm just looking at all my shit. Um, so, you know, but some of the sounds from from Justin, you know, he's making in his own little blender. So it, it's a mashup of, of, of quite a few things. I mean, between Justin, myself, and Chase Dobson, and then also um, Mutant, who was also on the record, you know, it's a pretty vast arsenal of synthesizers. So it would take a little while to go down the gear list but maybe i'll write up something at some point nice nice that would be great um because i think that is another thing that for you is important i mean having as much experience in doing it there's a lot of people that do listen to your albums and think i could get a sound like that you know but are but are interested in some of the nuts and bolts and they got to put their own seasoning on it they got to but, you know, I just always do like to hear why do you choose a particular instrument out of, you know, a thousand of them out there that, that this one, I don't know, is easy for you to get in the headspace of. Right. I think it's just, you know, familiarity. I haven't really bought any new synths in a couple of years. So I'm just comfortable with the gear that I have. And I, and I think ultimately I've got enough tools to do good work with. I probably don't need to ever buy another synth unless there's just something really unique about it that I, that I could see myself working with, but otherwise. And also I use a lot of, uh, you know, we tend to work in Ableton and Chase and I, and there's a lot of soft synth options as well. I love all the native instruments, you know, battery, absinthe, are, are uh, two of the very uh, commonly used uh, soft synths on my records. Yeah. Um, so then we start getting into the the horror, the 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 spook of the album, where where things start to really go dark. And your next song up is "Dead Fingers Talk," and in it's a shorter one. You know, it's kind of a a 
single or, or jump off, but yeah. just really starts to, I don't know, I increase the, the fear factor on the tone for me. Oh, cool. um, what was kind of the, the swerve that you wanted to do with this song to break things up at the part way point? Sure. Well, I, I feel like it's another club track. Um, so it's got, you know, there's an upbeat energy to it. Uh, conceptually, Dead Fingers Talk, I think that it, it kind of speaks for itself, uh, you know, that um, especially now, like with how far reaching history can fuck with somebody's life in an instant. And yeah especially for people that are operating at a high level of just being awful humans and the crimes and the things that people can get away with or try to get away with. It's like, it's going to come back to haunt you at some point. I, yeah. Most of the time. Uh, so dead fingers. Talk. Plus you're super rich. Yeah, exactly. And then even then, um, you know, you may have to fake your own death to get away. Um, but even then, I mean, now with cameras everywhere, it's True. just, there's no escape from yourself. And uh, and Dead Fingers Talk, the other unique thing with that is I'm a hu huge William S. Burroughs fan. And uh, I use, you know, he's one of my favorite writers and definitely has inspired much of my creative writing and the way I approach things. And even throughout this record, I've pulled, there's, there's lyrical references that are shared between songs that I'm making reference on one song to something mentioned on a pr prior song. And that kind of plays into the William S. Burroughs and Brian Geisen, like cut up method of, of writing. Uh, and so somewhere along the line, I had come up with Dead Fingers Talk, but then strangely enough, just like they even after I had recorded and finished this song, they came out with a book by William S. Burroughs, this long lost uh, text from a book that had just come out barely, like barely available in the early sixties, but they re just republished it in 2020 or 2021 entitled Dead Fingers Talk. And just like the other day, like a couple of weeks ago when I discovered this probably last month, like what? Dead Fingers Talk by William S. Burroughs. How, how do I not know this book? I have all of his books, but I have a song already titled that. And I, Rona was just That's like funny. watching me just be completely self-baffled. So and serious so, question now, have you been doing things. seances? And I will tell you, it's kind of creepy that if you were doing seances, that William S. Burroughs would be the first person you would contact. Right. So, some, 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 as Chase, Chase Dobson said, there must have been some serious channeling taking place. <laughs> so, um, nonetheless, that's I like how those sort of uh, strange, uh, universal glitches occur. <laughs> Maybe he's t he's Mr. Burroughs is encouraging me from his past to continue. A All right. So moving off and 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 on again. Uh, now we're going to the lost body hypothesis, which again ties right together here uh, with the uh, ghostly nature of our current journey. Right. So this is the end of last song on side one, essentially. So it's a little bit more of a of a slow burner. Um, it's a bit. I think I'll, I use the term vulnerable a few times when I'm re uh, referring to describing this record, and and I think this track is one of those and uh chase dobson uh kind of got it started because he had a very rough skeleton of this song that he was working on and i kind of it's like let me take a crack at fleshing this out and yeah. we're coming up with some words i think he just sort of had that like kind of grinding jiggy jiggy jig baseline thing in it kind of struck me in this weird, like almost nine inch nails -y kind of way without being like a derivative, but I just felt like it kind of had that, like this sort of eerie passion that sometimes comes through. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think of two uh, in particular, like broken nine inch nails kind of scratchiness to it. Yeah, sure. I, mean, I, I could agree with that. Um, and lost body hypothesis uh, is uh it kind of goes into 
delves into the sort of the religious allegory that is prevalent at times on instant exorcism. Um, whereas, you know, the lost body hypothesis is sort of about uh, Christ being dead, but the body's not in the tomb. And I thought about that in a way like, huh, like it kind of goes back to what we we're saying about, you know, having to fake your own death to, to escape from yourself. And it's like, well, did Schrodinger's Jesus, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well put. Um, so maybe he was the great escape artist. And um, so it's touching on some of that. All right. Now I'm going to turn it over a little bit to you on here um, to let you jump ahead to any other tracks, stories, contributors that, you know, cause we don't want to give away the whole exactly. story, you know, can't, can't, no, no, no uh, mystery left. So, that's right. but so. is there one that you do want to kind of call out why out of any track you could have put on this, it was important. You had this one maybe because of someone else that was involved in it or anything. But well, you make me want to talk about the last song and jump ahead if you if you got to to the omens and monuments. Yeah, so I don't really want to give away that. Uh, what, what do they call it when you spoiler alert? But <laughs> it, it goes back to um, so I do want to make special mention of uh, the track Mutatis Mutandis, mm -hmm. um, which essentially means when things are set as they should be or something to that effect, basically. Um, and that's a point that I think we're trying to all reach uh, because of, again, the great fracture that we've gone through. Uh, but my uh, Joseph Anger, uh, AKA Mutant, you know, M-V-T-A-N-T. Uh, he's my friend from San Antonio, uh, which is also where I grew up. And uh, Mutant has been doing just, he's killing it. And so he and I wrote this song together. I really wanted to, I just was so inspired by uh, his originality and, and his uh, enthusiasm for really classic, like drum machine, early synths, you know, like kind of the stuff that, the sounds that made early skinny puppy, if you will, um, like Kali K50 and just, um, we had a real good time. It's it's a, it's almost a real like cabaret Voltaire early skinny puppy sounding track, but it sounds really fresh and modern too. And I think that a lot of that just has to do with the way uh, Chase and I approached the the production mix of the album. That the 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 low end is really strong, whereas on some of the like late eighties industrial, the stuff is very thin, you know, and and yeah, kind of tinny and clicky. Um, I think we brought in this real wealth of bottom, low end warmth and punch that some of those songs just, they were just mixed differently at the time back in uh, the eighties and early nineties. So the beast you don't see, like there's this welling presence back there on kind of, like you said, like a cabaret Voltaire, but just this growling thing, but you, you don't quite see it in the music, but you know it's back there lying in wait. Yes. Um, sedatives and alibis is the, the 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 main line from that. And uh, I think that's something that everybody is caught up in. Um, the, the title track, uh, Immoral Emporium, was the first song that I began writing for the album right before I left on the Zymox tour in 2020. Uh, just a quick sketch and then I was like oh, I'll get back to this in a couple of months but you know soon I was back at it and I struggled with that song for quite a while to try to find my voice again I think that goes back in, into what you were saying about going from a first album into like what's this second album going to be and right. what's it going to sound like is it going to be very you know in dirgy and slow and dark and dreary or is it going to be an upbeat club album so but I'm really happy with the lyrics and I'm really happy with the way that uh, that track came out. I think that shows a pretty interesting depth of songwriting. And then that uh, takes us into um, the last track, which is essentially just written from the perspective of me uh, having already passed on to the other side in essence. So uh, like as I, I talk about watching my own death on, on the television, asking how did we get here? So 
Um, and that was sort of like a, a, a pact, I think is what I once said to Kevin Key about it, uh, was that it was a pact with myself to not like do anything stupid because I felt like I was prone to like throughout my life prone to some depression, but it's manageable. I think it's something that we all experience. Right. Um, and for some people it's far more severe, um, and people deal with their depressions through self-medication, self-harm, going to therapy, whatever. Right. So like, I just was, you know, when I was looking back at my journals, as I was writing, there was a period of time where I was just like completely, I was like, God, I can never talk to, about myself or to myself that way. Again, it's like, you know, like you fucking loser. What is the, your purpose? You're getting nowhere. You're, you're failing, whatever. It was just like, this sucks. Like life sucks. What's the point? And so I had to like kill off that person in me. And that's what the last song is. And it's about me saying, I think that I found a way through this dark shit. I think I might see a light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm not going to do anything bad today and hope that tomorrow brings a little more light and hope. And I think basically that's essentially where I left off with the album. And the third record will will be the will kind of William Burroughs summoning you. Uh, <laughs> yes. So that you know ultimately the next record will will be the summarization of of these first two, and then that will be the body of work that uh, this trilogy uh, that I've found myself in the middle of will will resolve itself. Well. Thank you for taking us on this journey, because mm -hmm. to me, I'm I'm really glad, you know, sometimes I feel like in these interviews, there is a little bit of formula to them. And, and I like that because we've done this and talked before, it really gave us a chance to, I feel like, let you start pulling stuff out of the sack and really, you know, showing us, uh, you know, a, a deeper dive of kind of your, your ideas and process when you were going through this. Sure. Um, do you have anything that you kind of want to talk about for people though, coming up of, I mean, are you taking this out on the road? Are you, what do you have coming up so people can see this and experience it live as well? Well, first I, I got to get you one of these keys. I have to have one of those keys. Um, so what's going to happen with this album is now that it has just come out, uh, the, uh, the Lacerations video is out now, and, which is the first single. And then the next single is Smoking Tongues, the opening track. And then that video will come out right at the beginning of October uh, as a single with the, there'll be at least a couple of remixes for, for club purposes with that as well. Um, and then after the video comes out, then shortly thereafter, the Clan of Zymox, Curse Mackie, and A Cloud of Ravens tour 2022 uh, begins. I'm so excited for that, too. I love Matt and Beth. Like, they are just wonderful, bright, glorious people. I love the music that uh, they do, but just the personality. I'm so stoked. I've, yeah, Beth and I have been friends for a really long time. And, and Matt, uh, you'll love his remix that he did for uh, Dead Fingers Talk. It's really cool. I'll, I'll uh, give you an off, offline listen at it. Um, but I, I'm really excited about the tour. This, you know, Ronnie Moorings from Clan of Zymox played on my previous album, and we were on tour together when everything shut down. So this will be my first full-fledged tour since that time. So I'm very eager to get out. Uh, this The dates that are currently booked are all like most of the Western half of the U.S. So um, I've and definitely intent on getting to from Chicago over to New York and down to Florida and every place in between. But this first leg takes us all through Texas up into Albuquerque, Denver, Seattle, Portland, Vancouver, San Francisco, LA, San Diego, Costa Mesa, maybe a couple other things that I'm not remembering. Um, so it's going to be great because I'm so excited to have two albums worth of material to choose from as well. So it allows me to go to, to get a little more diverse on a nightly basis yeah. with what sets that I want to do or what I want to play. So, um, but I'll be having these keys with me and That's so cool. it looks like key, an ax. 
Now, does it look like a key? It's a skeleton. I mean, it still looks like a key, but it kind of just looks like if I was, you know, playing Diablo or something, what I would be slicing. It as a weapon? Yes. Okay. (laughs) Uh, It has magical power, too. Not only does it chop people in half, uh, or you can actually uh, open up their, uh, you know, the window to their soul. (laughs) But basically, the key, which will be out on tour with me, uh, will be available. And then that'll unlock a whole bunch of other content within the Immoral Emporium world. But um, so, so basically, there, there's going to I'll be working with this record for a, a good while. Um, so I, they'll continue to un, to reveal new new items into the world of Immoral Emporium, as well as Instant Exorcism. And as they begin to merge, that third album will... Uh, I absolutely love known. the creativity of your physical media. Like you always, I don't know, to me, do this as good as anybody out there touring right now where people don't, they're not buying albums and CDs in the same way anymore. You know, your whole collection is digital and you always have it with you, yeah. but people still want something they can hold, yeah, you know, absolutely. and, and that matters. And like thinking up creative, unique ways that they can do that and support you is I don't know. I think the future, the name of the game in the future. Yeah, I know. Right. I think it's really important. And I, I, Rona and I talk about this all the, all the time. I really love sounds and shadows as a, as a forum, because I think it's one of the safe spaces that has given musicians and artists like myself. And I, I feel like I'm pretty established and I'm, I'm, I'm relatively okay, but at times I still wonder like, man, what, what, what's it going to look like in five years? What's, where's my sustainability? Where's my, how do I continue to, what if I am 80 and I still want to do this stuff? Like, sure. fuck, like there's no, there's no safety net. Right. So I think like that you it's said really- on the tour a minute ago too. I mean, touring is scary as hell right now. You almost have to do legs yeah. of tours because yeah. who could pull off a, the physical requirements, but B, just the planning aspects. Like it really almost takes four yeah. people that know individual scenes to properly book a decent tour these days, which not many people have that kind of hooks and resources. Right. Yeah, it is. Um, and I feel that way now. Like I, there's so much pressure internally on me for this tour to be successful with Zymox and they, and for them as well. And I'm sure for a cloud of Ravens, because everybody's been playing this long waiting game, but you can only wait so long um, until you must get out there and take the risk. And uh, you know, we we've all seen tours from people that we know and love fall apart, you know, a week into it after six months of waiting to go and then you're left with nothing to other to try to fucking regroup and and get back out there so i i like uh i do uh enjoy what sounds of shadows offers a forum for people for us to kind of try to figure it out and to provide a so so as much like this record was about so you don't feel like you're just alone trying to do this like there's we're we're, we have a shared experience and that we can help each other out if, if 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 people are willing to to divulge some some knowledge and and, and contribute. So uh, I hope that this album does give people the courage to continue trying. And it's just a matter of doing it and and having a having a plan B. Like don't quit your day job is is good advice in in 2022 or have some kind of other form of income. And it's, this is me getting back to why I like making art and making unique pieces that people can, can hang on to that are a little bit more permanent than just a digital download, uh, creates a a good bond. Uh, I've made a lot of friends through my art, um, fans that I talk to all the time now that I see in cities that I can't wait to see on this tour. So, um, I think that that's an important aspect for, for other artists is to have as much diversity in your portfolio. Um, and, and I think that is, there is this kind of lost art that what maybe a CD or a record used to be, these keys are a thing that I'm, I'm holding one in Kalamazoo, Michigan, 
And I might not even know them, or maybe I do know them and they're in Boston or Florida or LA or Berlin. And, and they're holding one too. And we're both a part of something and have something. And I think that that's a part of music that is is a bit lost, that we can find again if the artists putting it out uh, create that world and that scene again. I, I think that does still exist out there. We've just forgotten how to use the magic. That's right. Use the magic, Ken. This key will get you in. <laughs> so this has been a wonderful discussion, my friend. It was so great talking to you again. Um, I can't wait till we can put this out for our fans. But as always on Sounds and Shadows, I want to spin out um, from a track, give a taste to our listeners um, so that then they can go to Bandcamp and go out to the show and the tour coming up um, and, and get this album for themselves. So what is the track that you think is the the true juice the real epitome that's going to open the doors and i mean we did talk about it there was a good reason why you opened the album you the way you did but i'll let you pick here what do you want to spin out to um i think that smoking tongues should be held um Okay. For when somebody sits down to actually listen to the album in its entirety, I think the song that is just uh, like, let's just get into the fire and fuck around and see what this is all about would, would be Lacerations in the video. Uh, the video for Lacerations is cool. It was shot by uh, Static Industrial TV, uh, Rex Arcana. Yeah, Rex. Yep. 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 Rex. Uh, and Luke is awesome. So those guys did, uh, they shot the, uh, the live footage at Mechanismus Fest in Seattle, uh, right there at the end of June, early July. And then that was cut with uh, footage that Rona, Rouge Hart and myself edited. And so it's kind of, a, a, it shows a little bit, has some great live footage as well as some good yeah. visual stimulus. And I think that's a good representation I was just talking to Gabby about that. We're going to release uh, an interview tonight that I did uh, with Gabby, Eva X. Oh, yeah. And was she just talking great. about the experience at the same tour. So that's exciting. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, she she had a great show up there. So awesome. Uh, well, to all of our listeners out there in interweb land, uh, this has been Curse Mackey. Please go look up, check out Immoral Emporium the new album, and look for him out on tour. Keep it dark, y'all. Thank you so much, all of you.